welcome to another book conversation. I'm Mrs. Mester, librarian at Chinook Middle School. I'm Ms. SL, librarian at Sylvester Middle School. I'm Ms. McSheehy, librarian at Evergreen High School. And I'm Ms. Gunn, librarian at Highline High School. And today we're going to talk about Books at the End of the Rainbow or LGBTQIA plus uh, affirming books. So this is pretty exciting. And I, I think sometimes, you know, Pride Month is June and that's when our libraries have shut down, schools closed, and it's always we always are like, we need to make sure that we are highlighting these books all the time, not just in Pride Month. And so I'm, I'm excited about this conversation today. So who wants to start our conversation? Tell us about a good book and what you recommend. I want to start. Okay, I pick you. <laughs> um, I have picked some older books to talk about today because I think I frequently get caught up in new books and students get caught up in new books. And so I want to remind people of things that have been out for a little while. So the first book that I want to share, let's see, I have the picture of it, um, is called Ask the Passengers by A.S. King. Um, and it came out in 2012, um, but I still like, it's still one of my favorite books. Um, so the main character, her name is Astrid and she lives in a pretty small town and is like questioning a lot of things in her life. Like there's some stuff going on with her family. She's questioning things related to her sexuality. Um, but she, one of the places where she feels the most like at ease in herself, um, is laying on a picnic table in her backyard, like looking up at the sky and sort of like wondering about the people flying overhead in airplanes and where they're going. And she'll lay there and she'll send her love up to these like mysterious people in the airplanes, figuring that like, if they don't know her, like she can send her love safely and nobody will reject her. And there's no possibility of like conflict or confusion. It's just like, she's just putting love out there in the world. Um, Cause that's really different than how she feels um, in her real life. Um, I think that she has a lot of things that she's figuring out. This, is, this book definitely falls in the like the questioning world for people, not just with her sexuality, but with other things, which I think makes it super relatable to like a whole swath of teens. Um, she has developed some an attraction to a girl at her job. And what I think is really interesting about Astrid is like, she's completely fine with that. Like she's not concerned or worried about that what she doesn't like is in the small town what it means to be labeled and then how people treat you if they label you and put you into a little box so she is like why can't we just be the way that we are why do we have to be put in these little boxes um, and A.S. King if you know her as a writer she does a lot with um, sort of magical realism mm -hmm. so it's a very realistic book but there's these components to it um, that are not super realistic like there's an impact to the passengers in the airplane who she sends her love to but she also has sort of um an internal monologue going on with socrates as her like guide through all of this because she's taking an ap philosophy class and she refers to him as frank which i think is really funny but um it's a really just lovely book of you know coming of age figuring out who you are, how to deal with small minds and uh, prejudice and just, it's really awesome. So even though it's a few years old, it is still, still really good and people should check it out. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm thinking of, um, I see the ants. Is that what the, mm -hmm. is? And, and just, yeah. Everybody sees the ants. Everybody, everybody sees the end. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And like you know, when you mentioned the magical realism, I'm like, I need to read this A.S. King book because I enjoy A.S. King books yeah. and the weirdness of them and the beauty. So I just added one to my list. But but I, it, you also gave me a nice segue because um, my first one is a, a little older, too. And it is is um and that's why i was looking down because i'm like oh i have it, the picture of it pulled up on my screen but it's just easier to show it on my phone so thank you miss gunn um nimona mm -hmm. <laughs> and i picked nimona for a couple of reasons um i love how graphic novels are now becoming just wonderful places that are embracing lgbtq plus stories all stories um i you know um, and I also, you know, Miss Miss Mesher and I work with middle grade, and graphic novels are are the language of love in middle grade. 
afraid. Um, but also um, uh, Noelle Stevenson, who who wrote and illustrated the books, who many people already know from Lumberjanes, and uh, Ms. Mesher and I love the Lumberjanes. Um, she studied at the Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, which is in my hometown. So I had to give a little shout out to her. But I love Nimona because it's such a... It's such fun. And Nimona, the main character, who is a shapeshifter, can't, you can't determine very easily if she's a villain or not. And I, I love that because I feel like that's like a perfect metaphor for adolescence because <laughs> we just, you know, that's a time where you're like, am I good? Am I bad? Am I, what am I? Um, but she, um, Nimona goes on the path of villainhood and she um she connects with I mean, I've, I've got his name pulled up because I know I'm gonna get it wrong um I remember it's Ballister is his first name Blackheart who is the villain she tries to become the apprentice to but despite the name he's not very black hearted. He has this strict moral code and there's something charming about him. And his arch nemesis, Sir Ambrosius Goldenloin, is also his love interest. And okay, the, yeah, the names alone are worth reading this book. But also, you know, I love the trope of, you know, enemies to lovers in romances anyway but this is a little more subtle and a little and a lot more comical because they have a backstory where they were friends at first and and it, and it's not the center of the story but I kind of like that too because it it makes it it makes it more real like I love I love when LGBTQ stories happen. They're not like, look at this. I'm going to point big lasers at this because I want you to see what this is about. It's just, it's just a beautiful part of the story and a beautiful part of this, this young character, Nimona, her life that influences her. And as she tries to figure out who she is and who she wants to be, I think it also plays a beautiful backdrop to that because I think there's some influence on um, part of her being a shapeshifter is she can become quite monstrous and I think sort of the the love and kindness around her is is helping to guide her to different places so I love Nimona anyway <laughs> so that reminded me of like all the books I wanted to talk about but I will highlight um I will come back to this other one later, but the first one I want to talk about is Labyrinth Lost by Zordova Cordova. That is the first book in the Brooklyn Bruja series. And so there's a romance that just happens naturally. And so like, I, I, like, I don't like the insta-love in YA that happens frequently. I like it when it happens naturally over time. And in the main character, in, in Labyrinth Lost, the main character gets sucked into the underworld and has to journey through to rescue her family and her best friend follows after her to rest to help her and to rescue her and to save her and through the course of the book the main character realizes oh I actually love my best friend like I love my best friend with romantic love not just best friend love and like it really like it, it happens so naturally as part of the story and it's so accepting and um anyway the Brooklyn Bruja series is pretty great and it's definitely magical realism but also definitely fantasy like it's very much rooted in modern day Brooklyn and the underworld so yeah and it's um is it Ecuadorian like mythology that I think is part of the fantasy world that she builds which I think is really cool so like if yeah. you're a if you like the sort of fantasy mythology worlds like this is also a really interesting um path there as well yeah Ecuadorian meets Greek mythology, because there's also this element of, like, Daedalus. But I went to the underworld, yeah. I, you, no, you had me at underworld. But, <laughs> but it also, Miss McSheehy, I know, I know you're getting ready to speak about other books, but it reminds me of a book that you and I both have enjoyed this past year, Cemetery Boys, in terms of the Bruja and the... I haven't read that book. Oh, I thought you read Cemetery Boys. No, I want to, but I haven't. Oh, it's really good. 
think that was Miss Carlson. Oh, 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 I knew I talked about it with someone. <laughs> like I said, my memory is completely shot. <laughs> well, I will talk about, um, if, let's see, like a love story. It's not going to come up all the way. Oh, there it is. And it won a Stonewall um, honor um, award. And I actually listened to this book and I loved it. It, and the audiobook did such a good job because there's three characters and in the audiobook version, they all had very distinct voices and they were all telling their story, although they all come together as well. And this takes place during uh, the 1980s AIDS epidemic. And some people may think that this is historical fiction because it took place in the 80s, but I can't go there. I can't, I can't think that the 80s is historical. So I'm just not thinking about that. But um, during the 80s, um, um, in, the, in the early AIDS epidemic, um, there was so much... Um, news about gay men dying and just the tragedy and nothing could be done and there were so many unknowns and so much fear um, on how you can catch it. So that's where this story takes place in New York and there's three characters. One is Reza and he is Iranian and he recently um, well, not recently, but he's, he immigrated to New York City. And then there's Art, who is a very out, proud um, gay guy in his high school and one of the only guys who are out. And um, he's part of this, he's an activist in uh, a group called ACT UP, which is trying to bring awareness to um, the medical needs of um, finding a cure or um, just, and, and really by the, um, by the government, trying to bring that to the eyes of the government. And then Reza, who, um, who isn't out at all and is pretty much in denial about his sexuality. Um, and then there's Judy, who is a very, um, bubbly, outspoken friend, and um, the three of them, that's what kind of glues them together is Judy. And so Judy has this uncle who is, um, has AIDS, and he's in the last stages of, of um, that disease. And they just, um, the, the three of them come together, they're sort of like this love triangle that goes back and forth um, between Reza and Judy and then Reza realizing this is not who he is and then Art who's completely out and has getting signals from Reza but Reza is in denial and then you have Judy who's kind of caught in the middle. Judy is Art's best friend. So anyways it's such a there's, there's drama, but there's also just like really found love for a friend. And then also um, fear of, because so much was unknown during this time. And, um, and I remember what that was like. I mean, I was very young, but I do remember. And um, so I just, it's just, it's heartbreaking also to know that these these guys just don't know what, what to expect and are so fearful. And, but it's also heartwarming to see the friendship that holds them together. So that's um, like a love story by Abdi Nazanian. It's so good. So good. So that actually reminds me of Snapdragon by Kate Lay. Okay, so bear with me to explain the reminders. So this is Snapdragon by Kate Lay. It's a graphic novel, um, like a middle grade graphic novel. <clears throat> but um, main character, so it's got some like magical realism, definitely. Main character is gender non-conforming. Her best friend is transitioning. 
um, through the course of the story, discovers through this book that her grandmother is bisexual and had and left her longtime love because of fear of not just being in an interracial marriage, but in a same-sex relationship in the 50s. And so it deals with a historical context of um, gender and love and anyway, it's got this really great love story, but just it's, it's, but it's also this adventure and uh, it's really great. I was, I was nervous about it. I was like, oh, I love it. It's so heartwarming. I was thinking, um, Kelly, while you were talking about like you, your book is rooted in history. And the other one that I was wanting to share today is not, it's not historical fiction or rooted in history, but it feels like it's an older book. It was written in 2006. And so that's 15 years ago. And I feel like where books have come in the last 15 years in terms of talking about LGBTQ stories and characters, like we've come a long way, right? And there are more voices being told and more voices being heard. Um, but this one was pretty early on in the game and it came up, I think recently we were doing a talk and I mentioned a book called Kiss Number Eight. That's mm -hmm. a newer graphic novel. Um, and the authors of that talked about this book in their endnotes. Um, so I thought I'd bring it back. It's called Luna by Julianne Peters. Um, and it was a national book for finalist and came out, like I said, in 2006. Um, and I think it's the first, possibly first book ever, but definitely first YA book that I ever read that had a transgender character in it. Um, and it was interesting this morning, I was going back and reading some people's like reviews about it. Um, and it's been interesting how reviews on it have changed in the last 15 years, because um, one of the things that I think folks are not happy about this book with now is that the, the person telling the story is not the transgender character, um, it's a sibling. And so there's folks who are like, that's not cool. Like that's, we wanna hear the stories directly, which also totally makes sense. But then there were some other folks saying like, but if you are living in a more um, conservative community that maybe is more, is less comfortable with those stories like getting this through the eyes of the sibling is actually like an easier way in for folks so it could be a way to introduce folks to transgender stories in a like softer way if that makes any sense mm -hmm. um but it's told from the point of view of reagan who is the sister of a character who is trans but is not is very secret, like knows that in their heart that that's who they are, but like also knows that their family is not supportive. And like dad is like, you're my son, you're gonna play baseball. And like, just is there's no acceptance there. Mm -hmm. um, and so the sister like is the only person in the family who really knows what's going on and what their sibling is struggling with and trying to figure out. And so she is sort of an exterior witness of, of discrimination and pain, but also at the same time, like, is sort of struggling herself. So I just think it's a really like to, to go back in our history in some regards and like see where we've been in order to like move forward, I think can be helpful. So I think hanging, even if this book is not the perfect transgender representation, I think it brings um, an interesting point of view. So it would still definitely be worth reading for people. Now I have, okay, I'll try not to go on too crazy of a tangent, but now I have to go back to Cemetery Boys just to, just for a second, because the main character is trans and she is a bruja, but her family, her, her family refuses to accept her as such because they don't accept her her identity and they, they keep using her dead name and everything like that. But I met Aiden Thomas before the book was published, he was at Geek Girl Con. And so there was nothing for him to autograph. And I happened to have some Sylvester barcodes with me. And I'm like, I'm going to buy your book when you when, when it comes out. Will you sign this barcode? And he did. <laughs> and, and he's just delightful. And he has a new book coming out that I'm excited about too. But don't ask me the name because I can't remember things. Um, but then I want to jump back to what Miss Mesher was saying about... Um, uh, non-gender conforming um, characters. And for my second book, I had picked Molly um, Ostertag's um, Witch Boy series, partially because it's adorable and I was on a graphic novels kick and partially because Molly 
Molly Ostertag is married to Noelle Stevenson. And I, I just love that. <laughs> I love real life romance. Um, I have pictures they're hard to see of the three books in the series they're really hard to see I wish I could find one with they're all together but it's witch boy and then the hidden witch and then the midwinter witch they're actually in the wrong order on my phone um and um Aster who's the main character similarly to cemetery boys um comes from a family where um only those born as female are witches and um aster's a witch he's a witch and nobody wants to accept it and he kind of has to keep it hidden and his best friend charlie who is a female is also very gender non-conforming and you know some people would traditionally have said tomboy but there's more to it than that and i love the sort of playing with traditional roles but also with a magical kind of setting because I think it brings power to a situation that a lot of young people and older people um, feel very powerless in mm -hmm. and the, the, the witch boy all three books are just so dear and you will love the characters um, and um, what else do I want to say about it something else but I'm talking too much so <laughs> If somebody else wants to go while I gather my thoughts. <laughs> the the gender non-conforming um, reminded me of Wild Beauty by Anna, Anna Marie McLemore, which I've mentioned before, but that one's so, and also magical realism, that one's so magical, so grounded in fantasy, uh, the like folk tales, but also there's characters that things only happen to them because they're girls but are they really, and there's a character that you're like, what is this character's gender? Does it actually even matter? Um, <clears throat> and the left-handed booksellers of London by Garth Nix, there's uh, characters just gender fluid and is lovely. And everybody loves this character. Like they, like they're, this character is his person, this character's personality is so effervescent. And this character is just so, stunning and this character is just so witty and this character is just so smart that everybody around this character loves this character and then anyway left-handed seller booksellers of London title's a mouthful okay and then I have black flamingo good grief um and this is written by Dean Ada this is his debut novel and it won the Stonewall Book Award this year or in 2020. And um, this has the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and it's about Michael and he um, grows up in London and he is Greek, Cypriot and Jamaican. And he doesn't know his dad. His dad's not around, um, but he lives with his mom and, and he knows he's gay and he's fine with that. He hasn't really explored any relationships, but he goes off to university in London and um, he gets introduced to a um, group of um, this, this drag society and um, he's not really sure about who he wants to be as a drag in drag, um, but he's he studies people and he learns more about it, and he ends up just embracing his uniqueness, and um, he just comes out with this just so such a unique presence in the drag community. I actually learned a lot about drag, um, which was really interesting. Um, and the book is, a it's written in verse and the author is um, a poet and a performer. So his, his, the words flow just really, really nicely. And um, I, of course, love books that are written in verse for one, because they're really fast. <laughs> You could read them really quickly, but it's just such a, um, 
I mean, it, it, it just flows really nicely and it's such a good story and it's a unique story. Um, Cause I can't recall anything that I've read that have had um, characters in drag. Um, do you know one? Death prefers blondes is a What's mystery. Death yeah. prefers blondes. Oh, okay. That one's a mystery. Okay. <laughs> There's another new book called, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, but I think it's called Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens is a newer book that I think also has drag culture as part of it. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I highly recommend The Black Flamingo. I have a, a last plug for a book. Um, oh, yes. Because I was thinking that because the other two books that I had chosen were both characters who were like still struggling or like questioning their identity. Um, and so I was thinking about there's some similarities between um, how LGBTQ characters and stories are portrayed and how student like people of colors stories are portrayed. And sometimes we get really sort of bogged down in stories of struggle or stories of mm -hmm. hardship, which are, are fair and true, but that there's also a lot of joy in these communities as well. And so wanting to highlight that as well. Um, so again, this is an older book that I absolutely adore. Whenever people ask me for like a feel good book, this is one of my top ones. It's called My Most Excellent Year. And it's three um, characters telling their, I think in real time, they're juniors, but they have this assignment to write about like their favorite year. And all three of them decide to write about their ninth grade year. So you actually hear about their story from when they were ninth graders. Um, but the two guys, TJ and Augie, have basically been like they decided as five-year-olds that they were brothers on the playground and like that's their relationship with one another. Um, but Augie is gay and he, and like you, you get his story of like sort of how he came out, but it's very positive. And like his parents were both like, we, we were waiting for you to tell us like we knew, but we didn't want to push you and all this, but he just like, he's gay, but it's not, it's not that story, right? Like it's just these three friends who have these really interesting interrelationships and what they're trying to do with their lives. And it's just, I think it was probably the first book that I read with a gay character that just was like a character in the story. And it the book wasn't about the fact that he was gay. It was just part of his identity and everybody was accepting of that. And it's just the way that he was in the world. And I think, um, I think it was Miss Ellie, you mentioned that earlier with one of the books is like, that it isn't all about this thing, that it's just like, it's a story that represents the diversity in our world in just a really honest way um, and in a really lovely way with people who are awesome characters that I would want to hang out with. This gun, I want to read this so much yep. now. So oh, my, my dog is misbehaving, but um, shush dog. Um, but no, just talking about a book full of joy, um, makes me have to mention and I may have mentioned this already before but I'm obsessed with this book I love the gentleman's guide to vice and virtue by Mackenzie Lee because it is a book that you can truly describe as a dog as a romp <laughs> um, uh, hold on <laughs> yeah that one's like a regency romp through uh, yes. Europe, right? Th yes, thank you so much. Uh, there's an Amazon truck, so it's about to get really ugly in my house <laughs> with my dog. But yes, um, the main character, who's uh, Henry Monty Montague, is traveling through Europe, and, and he's bisexual, and he's he's a um, very spoiled, well-to-do brat who his father is endlessly disappointed in him, and he's been in love with his manservant Percy um, for a long time but they have to travel through Europe together and all kinds of shenanigans ensue but Percy is a man of color and this is 18th century so there's there's a lot of discussion of like you know race and and how this affects I mean the the race and the sexuality affect their uh, ability to be together and 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 be vocal about it but for such a serious topic there's just so much silliness and fun in this book I and also I love anything set in that time period and Mackenzie Lee is um 
bisexual, as is Monty. So, you know, it's it's nice to get uh, some some own voices talking about it. She wasn't alive during the 18th century, I don't think. But but <laughs> but I really just it's a funny book and it's so hard not only to find a funny book that deals with some serious subjects. Is it me or is it just really hard to find a funny YA book? It can be so difficult. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my, my last two are um, just dealing with that subject of joy and just being exuberant and excited. Um, they're superhero stories. So, because I think, I think a lot of times we look to realistic stories to tell real stories, but really superhero or fantasy or fiction allow, or science fiction allows us to explore all sorts of things. So Faith Taking Flight by Julie Murphy, the main character is coming to terms with her sexuality as well as her superpowers. And she like, it's, it's like there. And then Not Your Sidekick by, um, by Lee is another st story where the main character is like, hey, I'm not a sidekick, I'm actually a hero and also deals with her identity and as she's coming to terms with being bisexual and just really great. <laughs> Smasher, have you or, or any of our wonderful panelists read Dreadnought? Cause that is also an LGBTQ superhero book that I want to read. It's on my, my TBR pile. Um, but I, I wanna know if anyone's read it and what you think of it. Cause I'm intrigued. I have not. It was on my order that got canceled. Oh, sorry. It's fine. We won't mention it. <laughs> no, I, uh, so I see, I have been, I haven't read it yet. This is my point. Yeah, I'm with you, Kim, on the like, not like the way that books should be, right? Is that any book of any genre can have characters with any backstory, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're seeing that more and more in publishing. And that's really awesome. That's a trend that I hope, I hope continues. Exactly. Ms. McShahey, do you have any final thoughts? Well, I just want to do a plug for actually a nonfiction book. Um, <laughs> which is All Boys Aren't Blue. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can't remember the author's name. Johnson, George Johnson? Yes, George Johnson. And it's his story of coming to terms with his sexuality and as a black man, um, which was difficult for his family, um, but also, um, it you know, it can get a little explicit about, his first experiences and things like that. Um, but also to talking about trauma as a, a black man who is also gay. Um, but it's also like how he is able to overcome those things and fully embrace who he is. And the people around him are able to do that too. So it's nice to hear that firsthand hand account mm -hmm. of, um, of especially that intersection of being African American male and gay. So yeah, it's um, all boys aren't blue. All right, we've got some great books. I hope mm -hmm. people find something good to read and thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.